Okay. Yeah, let's get started. So, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Nice to see you again. Today we're going to do the second session about fortresses. I'm sure that you remember we looked at this uh, some time ago. A very interesting subject. Uh, it's really something that you can look at for hours. And uh, on this occasion, we will have a look at some different uh, subjects related to fortresses, how to build the fortress in practice, uh, how we can look for this idea in practical play, how to break the fortress once your opponent is trying to build the fortress, and so on. And I would like to start with this simple example, or maybe not so simple. As you can see here, white is the exchange up, but we have play on only one flank, which usually favors the side which is trying to build the fortress. And here, uh, as you can see, the pawns are on neighboring files. The pawns are on neighboring files. And this often helps the side which is defending. Like we saw last time, when the pawns are on the same file, if this pawn was on f4 instead, it would be easier for white to progress here. Sometimes we can push the pawns forward and we can enter with the king and so on. But here it's slightly more difficult to, to progress with white. Anyway, at this moment, black made a huge mistake in this game. And I would like to see if you can spot yourself which is the correct move and which is the bad move. I will give you two options here. I'll now flip the board because you're playing with the black pieces. Please remember that this move, this pawn moves this way and that pawn is coming this way, okay? I'm gonna flip the board now and I'll give you the two options. So, which are the options? Uh, we have two options, choose between Bishop e5 and Bishop c1. Which one is good and which one is bad? Okay, here we go. So, you have two options here with black pieces. You can go either Bishop c1 or you can go Bishop e5. I would like to know which is the good one and which is the bad one, okay? Two minutes. All right. Time's up. This was difficult. I can say that this was not easy at all. This was my warm up, but uh, definitely it was tougher than I than I thought. So we only had two correct answers here. Uh, first one was Rayo Chen, and second one Daniel Asario. So let's listen to Rayo. Rayo, explain to us which is the bad one and why. Well, Bishop C one is the bad one because. Um... First of all, the idea is to play bishop g5, of course, to like try to make a fortress. Uh -huh. But the problem is rook g8 check. And rook g8 check. Nice. So What's... he's dislodging the king. So he, uh -huh. he will go back, like f7. So if it, rook c8 is the answer. But if we don't have rook c, he's able to go back. And it's Sure, like... definitely. If we play something else, we could just go back with the king, right? Well, yeah, we can still play rook j, but that's not the point of the problem. Yeah, so, okay, repeating moves, you're right. But let's yeah, so look at the solution here. So please continue, Ryan. Rook c8? Uh-huh. Okay, and I'll I... put the bishop somewhere, let's say on, on b2, yeah? And now king f5. So eventually our idea is to um, play rook, c, rook c7 check, for example. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, king g6. Uh-huh. Okay, I'm going to play something here. And rook f7 takes f6 winning. Exactly. That's it. That's how we can break this fortress. And that's actually what happened in the game. Well, this was a blitz game. So it's, it wasn't easy at all for Antonetta Stefanova to find the right choice here. Uh, I don't think I would have made it myself here it was, if I was playing with the black pieces. But it's very interesting to notice, just like Ryo is saying, the white king would like to reach very much the f5 square. But the black king, of course, will not move away from g6. It's going to stay there. So the only way that we can actually force away the black king is, is by giving check. But like Rai is explaining, when the rook is giving check, the king will go back attacking the rook. So we need some kind of intermediate move. And that's the reason why bishop c1 is such a bad move. Because that's when we can give this check and then play rook c8. I can assure you that in, in endgame theory, there are many cases of these intermediate checks of this kind of, in or intermediate threats, perhaps, you would like to say. So what about bishop e5, Rayo? I guess you had a look at bishop e5 as well. That's the yeah, good yeah. move then, I guess. Yeah, because like, like now if you check me, 
Uh -huh. I'll just go back. You, you cannot move your rock along the G file, so you just have to go back and then go back. And... Exactly. I, I must go back. If your king tries to enter, I, I'll just go attack the G file. And then That's right. Let's let's uh, look at that. Let's have a look at King uh, D5 here. Uh, Sepper says rook g5 doesn't work. No, because the pawn is uh, this way. Or what do you mean? Oh, just to, just to, to avoid any confusion here. If you play like this, you will never win. I'll take, and this is a draw. You, you, I, I, this is elemental, right? If the pawns are still on the fourth and the fifth rank, this will always be a draw, as long as I am, you know, as long as I remember to, to take, the, take the opposition. Of course, if you had the pawns one rank, uh, let's say closer to the board. I mean, if the pawns were on G6 and, and G5, I'm sure we looked at this in the past, then you will win with white. But here, this doesn't make sense, right? Because the pawns are on G4 and G5. I hope that's uh, clear, clear to everyone. Now, let's let's go back. Uh, okay, so bishop E5 says Ryu, rook G8, king F7. Uh, I move away the rook, and Ryu says that he's going to go back with the king, and if I try to enter with my king, let's say I play here king D5, you're going to use your king, right? King G5. You can play king G5. And when I try to, let's say, I play rook G8 and I play king E6, what will happen? You're not threatening anything, so let me just move my bishop, for example. You can just move your bishop. I think we have a tactical trick here, Ryo. I might be mistaken, but, but I think I might have a trick here with white, which oh, G5. G5. Uh, I think I might have G5. I think if, if you would like to avoid this, yeah, yeah everybody sees, sees the idea, right? Then give check. So I, I guess black should avoid this. If you want to avoid this, you could before you play uh, king g5. Maybe here you could play a move with a, with a bishop, right? You could move it somewhere far away. So yeah. let's say you move like, uh, I don't know, bishop b2 perhaps. And when white gets closer with the king, let's say king e6, what would you play then, Ryan? Now I think I can do that. Sure. Now, now you can just go with the king. And here, as you're saying, white doesn't really threaten anything. And uh, yeah, there is no way for white to really progress here. Here, it's very easy to see that the fact that the pawns are on neighboring files, it helps black because obviously, if the pawn on g4 was on f5, well, white would just win by playing rook g6 and reflex f6. But here, this doesn't work because we have counterattack here. So I think we got it right, uh, Ryo. More or less, we understand this endgame. Uh, Black could make a draw here, but I think the only possible move actually is bishop uh, e5. We should put the bishop where it cannot be attacked by the white rook. We were looking at bishop c1, and I think bishop c3 would be the same story, right? We would just play exactly the same way. Rook check and bring the rook to c8. Um, and one last thing, one last thing, just so that this becomes crystal clear. We said bishop e5, rook g8, king f7, rook a8, and now Ryo said that the king should go back. But please notice that we should not move the other way with the king. That would be a bad idea because in that case, now white is able to enter with the king and we don't have any counterplay with the king anymore. Okay, so this wasn't that easy, right? This wasn't that easy. Black can make a draw here, but we have to keep the fortress. So the right move here, definitely bishop e5. However, I wanted to show you a little detail about this engine. Let's put the position here after bishop e5. Now let's say that this pawn on g4 was not on g4. Let's say that this pawn was on g2, okay? Let's see if we can bring this up. So here we are. Now suddenly the pawn is not on g4, it's on g2. So what difference do you think this makes? Anyone? Uh, I can give you one minute and you can just send me a statement about how this changes the position, why to play. What do you think would happen here? What's the big difference? Anyone? Okay, I got a lot of interesting comments here. Many clever observations. I, well, I wasn't able to answer all of you. So, uh, for example, Aradia and Rayo say that uh, now we can sometimes take on e5 and uh, there is no uh, opposition anymore for black. Okay, that's true. Uh, oh, sorry. We had another uh, comment here, which I, I th thought was very clever. It was, um, who was saying this? Uh, James was saying that now it's more difficult for black to arrange counterplay against the pawn on G2. But the biggest difference is another one. So I will, 
unmute Sarvagna. Sarvagna, please explain to us uh, what is the biggest difference here? How would you continue now with white? I'll flip the ball, okay? Um, so like, because the pawn isn't on G4, when the white gives uh, gives check on G8, then rook can go to G4. Exactly. And the white king to come to um, F5. Sure. I mean, now it's clear that black's king cannot go back. So black must do something against king F5. The only thing they can do is to play here king E6. Okay, this is still not so easy, Sarvagna, so you have to be very careful here. But you will win this endgame if you play carefully. For example, there is one blunder move which we shouldn't play here. Uh, Brian already found this move. Okay, but uh, I'm sure you can find it, uh, Sarvagna. Uh, rook G6 and then... Exactly, we should play rook G6. The blunder move is rook G7. I'm happy you, you didn't say that. Please be careful. Such... Uh, Disasters ha have happened in endgame practice. So rook g6, you're right. In this way, the pawn, now it's the pawn gets ready to run. Okay, black's going to play bishop e2, making, you know, making time. You're going to play g4. And here, as we can see, uh, when I move back the bishop, or I can put the bishop anywhere, but let's say I go back. Now you can see that uh, this f5 trick doesn't work anymore because you can take with the pawn. So what would you do with your rook now, Sarvang? Put it on g7. Like exactly. Now it's the right moment to play rook g7. Please notice that we shouldn't play rook g8, of course. That would be the endgame blunder, because then black can just go back, and we already saw this idea. So you're completely right. We should play here rook g7. Now that f5 doesn't work, we wouldn't have g takes f5 to check, so we win the game. Okay. So rook g7, it's my turn. Let's say I play bishop b2, and I think the rest is easy for you, right? Uh, rook b7 and then king f5. Oh, rook exactly, rook b7. Well, you're threatening my bishop. I must put the bishop somewhere, let's say, to avoid any tricks with g5. Let's say I play bishop c3. And the rest is very simple. Rook b6. Rook b6. And finally, you're king ready to play. King f5. Exactly, king f5. That's it. Okay, thanks, Arvagna. Excellent work. As you can see, this endgame is actually winnable for white. Yeah, uh, Ryo showed this in the previous example, we just give checked and rook g6 and we bring the rook to f7 and we take the pawn and so on. So huge difference, huge difference if we have the pawn on g4 or we have it on g2, big difference. Uh, I mean, in different, uh, in other aspects of chess, it's it's nice to move your pawns forward, right? To advance uh, your pawns, uh, gain space, uh, limit your opponent and so on. But there are cases in the end game where actually we're helped by keeping our pawns back in our camp, like here, for example, where we can win by means of this nice move, rook g8, king f7, and rook g4. Very interesting detail. We need a square for, for our rook. So when I saw this example, I came to think of another similar example where actually a pawn move. I mean, if you don't understand anything of this endgame, you would play g4. But of course, after you have seen this class, you won't do it, right? But if you don't know too much about endgames, you could make a mistake like the following. Let's have a look at this one. Maybe you know about this endgame. It was analyzed by Mikhail Botvinnik many years ago. Um, anyone, what, uh, what's up with the move F6? Does F6 work for white? What do you think? Aha, yeah, Ryo says premature. F6 is premature. It's a draw, it's a fortress. I know this. It doesn't work, says Sepper. Yeah, you're right. If we play F6 here, unfortunately, we lose half a point. This is a famous fortress discovered by, I think, by Botvinnik. Well, anyway, I, I remember a game of his where this uh, endgame appeared. So here it's black to play, and you should just keep your bishop on this, on this diagonal, and you won't uh, lose anymore. But OK, it must be a, a bishop spawn, and it must be this bishop. The other bishop won't work for you. The only thing you have to know about here, uh, what happens if I play f7? Anyone want to play with black? Aha, Ariane and Ryo, one second you play your king g7. Right, that's it. Please don't take that pawn. Then actually white wins by king f6. Yeah, this is well-known stuff, you know. Black is then Tsukso. So uh, there are many ways to win this. I mean, many moves which will win, but the right idea, of course, is to improve your pieces first, playing here king f6. And only then, yeah, black should put the king somewhere. Then I guess you can give check and just, yeah. This is just elemental, right? But the worst thing you can do here is pushing the pawn. So please remember this 
not always it's a good idea to push your pawns in the end game. There is this famous saying, past pawns should be pushed. But uh, here you can see this is a clear exception to that rule. This premature move, f6, would actually cost us half a point. So please be careful about this. And uh, remember, sometimes in the end game, it makes sense to first improve your pieces. All right, let's continue. Now let's have a past pawns must not be pushed, says Arya. No, but they should be pushed also. It depends on the, I mean, on the position, of course. Now have a, let's have a look at how we can break the fortress. This is uh, Dutch uh, Grandmaster John van der Wiel, who won this game in very nice fashion. I'll give you uh, yeah, two minutes so that you can tell me how to win with black here. I would need a little variation, OK? A little variation to see how we can win with the black pieces here. OK, time's up. So I would say this is not so easy, and it's also not so difficult. We had a few correct answers. I think Havish Sripada is one of them. So Havish, I'll unmute you. Please let us know how to win with black here. Yeah, so I thought king to c4 because, uh -huh. um, yeah, so if he plays bishop f2, we have rook a1 check, and then we basically pin the bishop. So sure. that's it. Like we were saying, right? When the pawns are already on the fourth and the third rank, we're ready to go for the pawn end game, right? Yeah, now we can just, yeah, we can take the bishop. We can... Exactly. Yeah, I don't think I have to show this, right? This is very clear to everybody. Once you take, once you put your king on any of these three squares, you win no matter who is to play, right? So, yeah, we don't really need to, to look at this. Well, let's see here, Havish, if I play instead uh, something else. I'm not forced to put my bishop on f2, of course. The problem is that the bishop uh, cannot stay on this di diagonal, right? I cannot stay there. So let's say I play something else, bishop f4. Bishop f8, I mean, sorry. Uh, yeah, now, now I can go king d4. Aha, uh -huh, that's the key move, uh, you know. Because you can see here, it's easy to see. If, if I play king d3, which is for a human, it's, it's more natural to try to get closer with the king. Well, why should we just go back? So the point is to move the king to the d4 square. And I would say in many endgames, actually key moves in such uh, endgames is when you put your king on the square of the opponent's bishop. If you can do that, it can make a big difference. I have seen this, for example, in opposite color bishops' endgames. Uh, such moves are key moves when you put your king on the color of their bishop. So you're right. Now I'm, I'm simply lost here. I mean, I cannot play anything. King f2, what would you play, Avish? Yeah, I think I can just go look at it. Sure, of course. Yeah, that's you don't even have to think about it. So then actually we end up in the same endgame, right? We end up in the same endgame that we were looking at. And yeah, we already know that Black will win here. The only way not to win would be to play King e4 and f3. <laughs> Please don't do that. But of course you wouldn't do that. You, you're going to play King g2 instead, something like that. OK, thanks, Havish. Excellent work. So King c4, I, I think this is the only way that you can win here. Some people are telling me that we should bring the rook to to e3, I mean, that's really imaginative thinking, but uh, I guess I could just stay with my with my king here. And I don't know, uh, rook e2, rook e3, okay, I'll go back. So you can, if you like, you can play king d2 as well, but I'm not forced to take. Maybe I can go for that pawn, what do you think? So it's, it's an interesting try to try to break the fortress, but it's not working. It's okay. Oh, did I blunder? No, I don't think so. Oh, oh yeah, you're right. Assist. Yeah, you're right. I, I thought I had something. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm about to lose now. Don't do that uh, at your place. Don't do that. Just stay with the bishop where it was. Yeah, you're completely right. Just stay there and black won't be able to, to progress here, right? So let's play something like bishop b6. And yeah, you're right. I fell into that little trap myself. Uh, bottom line, this is our best diagonal Black won't be able to break the fortress here. Aha. Yeah, you're right, Alex. I think it's just bishop b6 or bishop b7. I think so as well. Aha. So, uh, interesting example. White was close to the fortress here, however, but by this very nice move, king c4, going backwards with our pieces. This is not so natural, but it's very strong. We need to get rid of that bishop from this diagonal. And if they move the bishop this way, well, we should then use the d4 square. Nice move because they cannot come back to the bishop. All right, let's continue. So this is something easier. 
I just showed this game because it was played recently in the Chinese Championship. Maybe you saw that Yu Yangi became a Chinese champion. However, he lost this game. And uh, yeah, at this point, uh, there is no way for, for him to save himself. Um, I think this is very simple. So I've just asked ask for a volunteer here. Uh, who would like to play with the white pieces and try to, to break this fortress? It's not very difficult. So um, can I, says Anika. Yeah, sure, Anika. Okay. Since you were the first one to ask, of course, you're going to do it. So Anika, you're playing with the white pieces. Please go ahead. Um, okay, maybe I can try to play something like um, Rook A8 first, so I can like bring my Rook sure. and like. Sure. Okay, I'm gonna put my King somewhere. Okay, maybe now um, Rook E5. Sure. Uh, one thing uh, which I like about your maneuver is that your Rook is now very far away, so no chance for Black to create some kind of. Uh, and then now possibly form. Rook A6. Oh, rookie six. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I'm coming back. So, I mean, you can do this, no? But in the game, actually, uh, Shao Jun played here, use the king first. So let's try again, Anika. Okay, let's use the king first. Maybe king e3. Sure. King e3 was played in the game, then followed king e5. Then king and the next d4. Movie. Of course, king d4. I always like, you know, this topic of this distance. I call it the magic distance in my endgame book. In this way, you make sure that they cannot give you checks and you dominate the knight somehow. Uh, okay, let's continue. Black played here, king g6. Yu Yangi goes back with the king. Now, of course, we should not play king e5. That would be a dreadful mistake. So uh, where would you put your rook? Uh, I mean, it's it's natural to play rook a8. It works as well, Anika, to play rook a8. Your, your idea. I looked at this my, myself. It looks very logical, no, to bring the king here and then try to enter with the king. But actually, in the game, they put the rook somewhere else. Where do you think they put the rook, uh, Anik? Maybe rook c8. Yeah, you could put it on c8. But you know, if you want to play king e5 later on and you don't want them to give check, where would you put the rook? On rook d8. Exactly. So they play rook d8. Very nice. Now you can see that the knight is really short of good squares. They played in the game here. King f5. I have one question for you, Anika. What would happen if black played here g4? Which would be your reaction to this? Um, maybe I would just, um, I think maybe pushing my pawn forward. Exactly, you should push the pawn. Please remember that uh, the more pawns on the board, the better for the side playing for a win. If you take on g4, actually you would drop half a point here. Black would take with the pawn, and believe it or not, this is a fortress. Black would make a draw here. My next move might be to play knight h5, targeting the pawn on g3. Uh, this is not, not uh, although it looks like white would win, I think it's a fortress. If king e5, for example, you can play here knight, what would you play? Knight h5? Oh, interesting. No, you cannot play knight h5, no, because then I would play uh, rook g8. But you can play king g5, right? That's a good move, yeah. I guess. And then you have knight h5 coming up. So this is, uh, I think it's a fortress. Anyway, no reason to enter that. Much better to play like you say, h4. So you fix a weakness here, and then you can continue with entering with the king. Let's look at the game, uh, Anika. They, you played rook d8, I played king f5, and uh, here white played rook d6. This is a nice move in order to limit the black pieces. Now king g6 is impossible, of course, due to king e5. So it's, it's easy to win this end game. Uh, in the game, uh, Yu Yangi played here h4, which loses for several reasons. But I think white played the nicest move here. I mean, you could just win the piece by g4, right? Uh, this would win the game immediately. But even nicer is what he played in the game here, uh, Shao Jun. Yeah, Anika, exactly, you're right. Rook takes f6, that's it. And now we play. OK, you, you unmuted. Uh, you muted yourself, Anika. OK, what would you play now, uh, Anika? Aha, g4. Of course, that's it. So now we have the good old opposition again and white wins. That's how the game finished. Aha. Yeah, if you win the piece, the two pawns can be very dangerous. Yeah, sure. This was a very practical way for white to 
plane. So as you can see, it's easy to take these forces. It's easy to take the forces. You have to keep a few things in mind. One of them is to restrict the black knight checks. For that reason, the rook is very well placed on d8. But we could also play, like Annika said, rook a8 in order to put the rook a bit further away. And the other thing, of course, whenever black invites to pawn exchange, we should usually decline the pawn exchange. We should try to keep more pawns on the board. Now let's look at something slightly more difficult. OK, so we have seen here white wins by playing king e3, rook d8, king d4. Please remember, remember this technique. Uh, you will use it very soon. So look at this end game. Now it's getting more difficult, right? Now you're playing with the white pieces. I want you to send me a short variation about how to win here with white pieces. So why to play in wind? Why to play in wind? Please send me a short variation, OK? All right, time's up. We had several good answers here. Uh, yeah, like uh, Troy and uh, Sepper, uh, James, Asis, uh, Havis, uh, yeah, Ryo, a lot of people. <laughs> Arian Gutla was one of the first ones. So please, Arian, share with us how to play with white here. So basically, if you have a pawn in game and move his pawn to and his, you move his d pawn to death file, you're gonna win. So, so first, yeah. So first, you need to do that by playing king d4. Okay. So if I play knight f4, then rook f8 check and rook takes f4. Exactly. Yeah. Here and h4. Yeah, that's very important. No, we shouldn't let the black king enter. So h4 and uh, white uh, wins. Uh, yeah, we can play one more move here so that it's clear to everyone. Yeah, sure. And this pawn will drop off and yeah, you're going to win the game. Uh huh. Um, please notice the importance of having two pairs of pawns, right? If, it, if these pawns were not on the board, it would be a draw. But having being more pawns on the board increases the chances to win the game. OK, so let's see here. King d4, I would have to play something else then. So let's say I play knight f6. But now this is good for you, right? Because now my idea of, of a fortress with knight f4 is not available any, anymore. So how would you continue yeah. here, uh, Arian? I, I think I possibly is long here with rook h6. Oh, with rook h6. Interesting. They didn't play that in the game. What might be the, the reason? What about, just for, for the record, if I play Wait, g4, what yeah, happens? Yeah, just g4. Just g4. Maybe this is a bit uh, impractical, no? Because... If I'm able to swap those pawns, uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be a draw. I don't know if you can somehow keep the pawns on the wall, uh, take uh, take with this one, maybe something like this. No, but I don't think so, no. It, this looks drawish, no? Yeah, maybe I can play draw. g3 here. Yeah, it, it, it seems white cannot go back because there is the check and so on. So this looks to, like we should avoid it, no? Um, so try to find a better square for your rook. You might be tempted to play rook d8, but like we saw in the previous example. But actually, there is a better move here for white in order to, you know, uh, to put them in Tsutsui, something like that. What if rook h5 after g4? What if rook h5 after g4? Yeah. Let, let's see here. Wow, you're right. Yeah, you're winning the game, right? H-pawn, H-pawn, yeah. Sure. I mean, yeah, you're, you can win H-pawn, yeah. Oh, I didn't see that one coming. Yeah, you're right. That's, yeah. that's winning. So I can't play. I'm just saying that the, the rook looks curious on this square, but but, maybe it's, it's, uh, but maybe I can move the king then, can't I? I, I mean, I, I wouldn't put my rook here, uh, but oh, yeah, who knows? Yeah, maybe yeah, it works. Yeah, maybe it works. Uh, it's possible, no? But I mean, uh, you have to even look out for, for rook f. So, okay, but then you can go back. Anyway, uh, let me tell you that this endgame was analyzed by Karsten Mueller, who is a very famous endgame expert, a German grandmaster as well. And he, he showed that white will win here, starting with the move rook f8. And here, uh, after king g6, he suggests here rook d8. Now we have the same idea, of limiting the knight. Black would play king f5. And the interesting thing is that now we cannot use the previous plan anymore. It's not possible. We cannot get any further with the king. So here, what you should play with white, but this is very difficult. You should actually play king e3. So uh, let's, say, let's say, Arian, I play now king e5. It appears as if black is holding, right? 
What's the point of this? Aha, uh -huh, what's the point? Well, White has a very surprising move here. Let's see if you can find it in order to win this endgame, Ariel. Very, very surprising move. Uh, please execute it before I get a chance to put my knight on the fourth. Aha, uh -huh, so Alexander, Sepper, James, they all found it. Aha, uh -huh, you're right, guys. That's the right move. It's F4? difficult to play this move. Did you find it, uh, Ariel? F4. Exactly. I think this is a paradoxical move. F4, F4 then king to left to Exactly. This is a nice uh, piece of uh, endgame uh, trick, you know. You give up the pawn because now black is running out of moves. Now you can pick up the pawn, right? Yeah. So rook e4. Here, rook d4, yeah. Aha, you pick up the pawn. And even if there is only one pair of pawns left, like we were saying, when the pawns are on the same file, it's much more difficult to defend. Black would very much prefer to have their pawn on the G file or the white pawn on the G file, for example. But here it's just a matter of entering with the king and you win, something like this. Yeah, you remember this plan of moving the rook far away and we're ready to enter with the king and white will win very soon. So this is an interesting uh, end game. Okay, thanks, Arian. You got it completely right. The right way to go here, king d4. Uh, of course, it's important to see this tactical detail with rook takes f4. That's a key variation in this example. Um, in the game, unfortunately, white uh, maybe didn't have too much time on the clock. I don't know. They played here king f2. This was a bad mistake. Now it's a draw. Now it's a draw because black hurried to play here h4. And now knight f4 will come next turn. There are no tricks with rook f8 and rook takes f4 anymore. White was unable to Progress here, rook f8 followed in the game, king e5, rook g8, king e5, and yeah, it was a draw here. Uh, what a pity, no? White was so close to winning this endgame, but uh, they played it in the wrong way. Uh, huge difference with the pawns on f3 and h3, which means black has a good square on f4. So for that reason, we should play king e4 and later on actually prepare this surprising f4 move at the right moment, uh, as analyzed by Karsten Mueller. Very impressive variation, in my opinion. Uh, it's good to know this stuff. So now let's continue. Let me show you something else here. Now it's slightly different here. You're playing with the white pieces. And I will give you two minutes in order to tell me which is white's best move here, okay? You have two minutes, or let's say just one minute, okay? Because you're a very bright chess player. So one minute, white's most promising move, please. Just tell me which is white's most promising move, okay? Okay, I, give you, I gave you very little time on this one. Uh, but I, I just wanted to see your reflexes here. Um, so, some people were saying the move bishop d3. Others were saying bishop d3. And we even had the last candidate move here, rook a2. Let's make this in a different way. I'll ask a new question. From these three moves, which one do you think is the worst? Okay. From rook a2, bishop e3, and bishop d3, which one is the worst one? Which one would give away half a point? That's your question now. Okay, I got several right uh, answers here from Angela, James, um, Alexander Wang, Jed Sloan, and Ashish Panda, I think. Maybe there was some more. Anyway, fastest one, Asish. So please, Asish, uh, explain to us which one is the bad choice here. Oh, I said rook a2 is the bad choice since after rook c4, a7, rook c8, a queen. Uh, I think the pawn such is too weak to create any chance. Exactly. Like G, g5. And yeah, I can definitely. just sit there. You can just sit and wait. You're completely right. That's how the game went, let me tell you. And uh, yeah, it was a draw very soon. White cannot progress here. It's funny to see their king. Uh, very bad pawns. The king would have to make a long journey in order to improve, but then also they would have to be careful about the black pawn. So this is a dream fortress for black. Uh, what do you think then, uh, Asish, would be the best choice here for, uh, for white? I said like bishop d3. Uh, ah, I also think that's the most natural choice because you could use the bishop in, on both flanks, right? Yeah. Now uh, I would have to play, uh, I guess, 
uh, rook a7 i must keep the rook on the board so uh, yeah you can you can play i don't know oh. maybe rook c6 check yeah yeah rook c6 bishop e4 bishop e4 i think white is playing for a win here black must be very careful this pawn is very strong so um this is a grand master playing with the white pieces. Uh, I guess in time travel, he simply forgot about the fortress when he played rook a2. I mean, this is a, another typical endgame principle. Put your rook behind the passed pawn, or even if, no matter if it's yours or your opponent's passed pawn, put your rook behind it. But here, like as he is explaining, like would take on c4, give up the exchange because they have noticed that they have a very safe fortress here. Similar to the previous fortress. In the previous fortress, the pawn was on page three and even so white was unable to win here it's even worse of course because black has a past one so please be careful with this stuff uh please remember that when you're better in the end game like here we are up a pawn uh try to keep pawns on both flanks so bishop d3 or perhaps even bishop d3 these are very good moves uh black can definitely not take oh sorry black cannot take in that case uh there are pawns on both flanks and white will just i guess play a7 and yeah, I guess I could even just queen, right? Uh -huh. And uh, and if they play rook a7, they become very passive. So, yeah, white is playing for a win here. Take on g6, and if they go somewhere else, I guess we could play bishop e4, right? All right, let's see what else do we have prepared for today. MVL against Carlsen. So you're playing with the white pieces here. Try to break Carlsen's fortress. I will give you only one minute. Uh, you can just tell me with words, with words. What do you think is the right plan here? With a, with a one sentence, you can explain to me how to break this fortress. Why to play and when. Okay, time's up. I'm aware that I didn't give you a lot of time, but uh, okay, this was actually a, a speed game uh, played on chess.com. So I guess MVL didn't have a lot of time either. Uh, many of you got the right plan here. Uh, so let's listen to, to one of those who, who explained the right idea, uh, Alexander Rutter. Okay, Alex, you're on. What's your winning idea? Here? Uh, yeah, so my plan was to sack the queen for the rook without giving away the c7 pawn. Sure. So I think you could do that by playing queen d6, queen e5, king d2, queen c3. Oh, that's an interesting plan. But I mean, uh, but you shouldn't let me keep the bishop on the board, right? Uh, I guess. Oh, yeah, you can just play king d3, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, what you're trying to say is that we should always look into the idea of sacking the queen at some moment. And uh, that's definitely what, what happened in the game. But, uh, but it will be difficult for you to win, I guess, unless your king uh, improves, right? I mean, your, your queen is in a good place, and so is the pawn, obviously, but we cannot progress right now. Yeah. So we need to improve the king, I guess. So for that reason, which do you think would be the best move for white here? Queen d4. Queen d4. But don't sack the queen uh, still. Uh, it's not a good moment to sack the queen. Aha. Uh, uh -huh. So... Oh, yeah, sure. King d3. Exactly. Some people are saying this move as well, as Cis, Sepper, so on. Yeah, that's the right, right way to go. Now, if let's say I play king g7, you would like to cross the fourth rank, but you can't because the black rook is there. So now you can use your idea of sacking the queen. How can you create a threat of, of sacking the queen, so to speak? What would you do with your queen here, Alex? Queen e7 or queen d6? Exactly. That's it. So you can see what's happening here. We're now threatening to take on e6. Well, it's not a sacrifice in itself, perhaps. But I mean, the idea is to dislodge the black rook from the fourth rank. And I cannot move. I mean, I cannot stay, right? I cannot stay on the fourth rank. What would happen then? Then I think you just sack me from it. Yeah, then you can sack and I guess you can queen next. I don't think that's a fortress. This fortress will not work for, for black. But okay, we should always have a look, no? But I think a move like maybe queen c5 later on, we will attack this pawn, they cannot protect it, we will have queen f8 and so on. So, or maybe maybe you don't have to be that drastic, or maybe you can play uh, queen c6 or queen c5. I think it amounts to the same thing, right? We're going to uh, queen and, uh, yeah, this is not a working fortress for black due to uh, existing several weaknesses here. So in the game, they played king d3. Uh, Carson didn't play king d7 because he noticed this move, queen d6, and 
the black rook would have to move away and now we would be ready to to enter with our king let's say maybe give check and then let's invade with the king let's see what happened in the game black played rook c6 uh what did white play here alex just stick to your I plan king e4. of course we, we just continue with our king march black played king g7 king e5 king e5 and now as you can see black cannot go back with the king what would happen then king f6 yeah of course we're not afraid of any discovered checks here we're actually about to mate uh, black here with uh, queen f8 next so in the game they played rook c3 i think just king d6 king exactly king. we're not again there is no problem with our queen hanging because yeah we will have a new queen then so they took on g3 you can guess white's next move here uh, alex c8 uh -huh. I mean, if you play c8, well, that's that's an interesting move. It's extremely unnecessary to play it, but okay. Yeah, I think you just have made into of the so. Exactly. I guess you can still win this position with, with white, but uh, yeah, why make it so complex? You can just go for, for mate, right? Yeah, mate in three is always better than promotion. Aha. Uh -huh. So uh, just go for the mate here, uh, Alex. Just go for the mate. Sure. King e7, black played rook e3, and what did... Queen f8. And then king yeah, f6. queen f8. Yeah, and, and here Carlson resigned, seeing that if king h7... Yeah, it's, it's game over, right? Last nice move of the game. Yeah, exactly, king f6. So it's it's over. So I, I guess it's a nice, nice example. It's not so difficult, but uh, very practical. If you want to win this game, you have to use the king. And you have to... Just like Alex is saying, you have to consider sometimes uh, sacking the queen. Or, I mean, temporary sacrifice. So king d3 is the right choice here. And later on, we should try to uh, use this idea in order to dislodge the black rook. If they play rook c6, we will continue. And yeah, we saw the plan here of moving the king. Somehow get closer with the king. Without the king, we can't break the fortress. Okay, nice. I have another example, uh, a bit similar. Uh, Salem versus Antipo. This is a typical fortress situation. Why to play and win here? Should I give you two minutes on this one? Yeah, uh, this is your only chance. At this moment, you have to break the fortress. How can you do it? Careful with the move order. Why to play and win? Okay, time's up. Many of you got it right. Uh, I don't think we have the time to name all of you, uh, but uh, many of you discovered that we have like three ingredients you could say here we have the b5 thrust we have the f5 thrust and we have the check on e5 maybe some ideas of even playing queen g3 the important thing here is to look for the most exact move order and uh Sepper Godzofidi managed this so please uh Sepper, share with us how to win with white here so like i thought f5 because if e takes the idea is to bring the king to e5 and play b5 well, you, you could do that maybe, but there is a much faster way to win here. Please notice that the bishop is now in danger, right? So what would you play? Notice that uh, in the... In... Sorry? B5. Yeah, exactly. We play B5 because now if black takes on B5, we just win the bishop, right? Yeah, queen E5, queen takes. Aha. Uh -huh. And if they don't take the bishop, well, we have a passed pawn for free, and that will decide the game. So you're right. F5 must be played first. Uh, by the way, did you look at the other way around? Did you look at B5 first? Uh, no. Uh... Oh, okay, good for you. Uh, you didn't waste time looking at that. I looked at it. You know, the big difference here is that now I can take, and there are uh, less pawns left on the board. Also, I have my own passed pawn. So if you take that pawn, I could play here bishop e7. I have I had a look at this and I'm fairly sure that this is a, a fully working fortress. Uh, after all, I'm only like two pawns down or one pawn down. So I don't think you can win here. So uh, back to your variation. Okay, f5. Yeah, we cannot take with the e pawn due to b5. Let's have a look at g takes. Okay, you can continue, Supper. How can you exploit the fact that the black pawn uh, took on f5, the g pawn took on f5? Yeah, I wanted to play king g3, king f4, king g5. 
but I think that that's too optimistic because my bishop is also working on the dark square. So yeah, if you play king g3 at some point, uh, I, I will definitely consider to play bishop d7. I think you should act uh, act faster here, yeah, act queen, quickly. Queen g3 and queen g5. Exactly. So that's what happened in the game. Salem played queen g3 check, and after king h7, he played queen g5. Now the thing is that white's gonna take this pawn. Black cannot defend it. Uh, if we play a move like bishop f3, well, that happened in the game, but okay, we can talk about it now. Uh, how can you uh, avoid the bishop protecting the pawn? How would you fight against uh, black's defense? Uh, support? King g3. Exactly. We just play king g3 and the bishop, no matter where it goes, we can go f3 next move. I mean, oh. bishop b2, f3. So this doesn't work for black. Also, if I take on b4, as you can see, this pawn on h4 is now a winner. It will be the hero of this game. Uh, I think you can even play here queen f6. I think this is the nicest move. Then you just continue with the pawn. So in the game, very quickly, bishop d6 check, king, G, king g1, bishop f3. White played here. Queen f6, yeah, you should use the queen a lot in this end game. The thing is that this pawn will come off sooner or later. Black tried king g8, trying to keep everything protected. But white, now that the bishop is no longer on the h to b8 diagonal, uh, what do you think white played, uh, supper? Uh, Aha, king h2, exactly, you're right. That's the way. Now uh, your plan suddenly wins the game, right? Uh, black played here, bishop d5, king g3, and white went on to win. Because this pawn, like we're saying, is going to drop off very soon. Aha. Interesting. But th this case I like because I think it's about timing. No other, any other move here won't win. I would play bishop e7, and I'm avoiding this idea of queen g3, queen g5. So you have to act on the spot here. And I'm sure that Salem knew that this was a critical moment. And that's why he played in the right move or f5 first, first to see if, if he should go b5 or if he should go queen g3 and queen g5. That's the way how to work against fortresses. We talked about it last time. Sacrifices is one of the key ideas against fortresses. Okay, let's see what else. Let's do a few more examples. We talked a lot about how to break the fortress, but now I think we should have a look at how to build a fortress, how to get to a situation where we can use a fortress as a defensive idea. And here is one of my favorite players with the black pieces, Bent Larsen. Bent Larsen was in a difficult situation here. You can see that he's a pawn down. White has a dangerous pass pawn. But Bent Larsen found a very practical solution to this difficult situation and made a draw. So uh, I will give you two minutes. Send me, please, a short variation how to save black here. OK, time's up. Well, many of you found the right idea. But uh, we had one student who found the actual course of the game, and uh, that's Havish Sripada. So please, uh, Havish, share with us what did Bent Larsen play here? Yeah, so bishop to c5, and after king to e4, there's bishop into e3, king into d3, bishop into b6, rook into a3, and bishop into f2 with the fork. And uh, what makes you think that this is a fortress? I mean, there's only two pawns, and if you look at white's king, it seems kind of distant, and it seems easy to exchange pawns with moves on h5. Okay. Uh, one last question for you, Havish. Uh, do you think it matters that the pawn is on, on g4? Could it be on g2 as well? If it's on g2, it probably wouldn't be, because the thing about the pawn being on g4 is we can exchange it off with h5. Ah, OK. Ah, Maybe okay. we can play also h5. Yeah, you're right. But I think there is another detail here. Anyway, thanks, uh, Havish. Great work. There is a famous fortress. Uh, I think we talked about this. If you have the pawns arranged on light squares, you have the king on g8, you can just put the bishop on, let's say, f6, and uh, you will make a draw, uh, especially if you can get the pawn to h5. Uh, however, we didn't uh, achieve that with black here. So I think, actually, black is in some danger. The only way that you can save this for black is to put your bishop on h4. And that was known by Bent Larsen, of course. But I think if you don't know about this idea, okay, they played king e4 in the game, black played g6, arranging the pawn on the right color after king e5. Larsen had to play here bishop h4. Only in this way, uh, they, are they are able to, to make a draw here. Okay, this is how, how the game went, and later on it's a draw. Uh, 
but I think if he had neglected this part of the plan, uh, he would have lost the game. So I mean, if if, if White if Black would play something like, uh, if they would have brought the bishop to the long diagonal, well, how can I do that? Uh, okay, let's say I play something like. Yeah, actually, there is no way. There is no way for 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 them to do that. But what I'm saying is that it's important not to let White play h4. That's maybe I could explain this in some better way. Um, if I put the bishop on, let's say. Or can I put it on c5, for example, some, something like this? Uh, if I would neglect this part, if I would neglect this part of the plan and let white play h4, I think white would win here. Uh, king f5, maybe h5 could be played first, h5, king f5, and so on. White would have very good winning chances here because the pawns are on the wrong color. So it's important when you look at this fortress idea that you remember to put the bishop on h4. Okay, so let's see the position from the beginning. This was a difficult uh, situation for Black. Uh, a move like rook b3 would let the white king come closer and this would end in a win. So it's the right moment to play bishop c5 after king e4. Yeah, this is a diff difficult move, bishop takes e3. But actually, I think we had a student who was saying here, pawn takes e3. That would have been a better choice. Actually, if you're playing with the white pieces here, that's the right choice. Uh, Bent Larsen was explaining that he was going to play rook b3, and uh, in this kind of position, white would have decent chances for a win thanks to the passed pawn. However, like uh, I think Havish was saying, the move h5 is interesting here. So in this way, black tries to, to swap off pieces or at least to bring out the king. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, so this would have been a better choice for white to play for a win. But even so, uh, Bent Larsen's choice was the right move here. Bishop c5, giving up the exchange in order to liquidate, eliminate the pawn on b6. And like we were seeing here, the very important idea of putting your bishop on h4. Very important idea. All right, uh, let's see what else. Yeah, th this one is, is fairly easy, I, I would say. This one is fairly easy. Uh, recent game, Kovalev with white pieces against Van Forest. How do you think white can make a draw here? Which would be the most practical way of, of making a draw with white? Um, I'll just give you one minute. Send me what you think is white's best plan here. All right, time's up. Uh, yeah, this was a difficult one. Uh, we can listen to, to Rohan on this one. Okay. Rohan, Rajaram, please share with us, which is White's best move here? So I think White's best move is Bishop takes B5. Uh -huh. um, he'll play Rook C2, uh, so, then he'll play A4. Oh, you're just betting on the pass pawns. Wow, that's uh, not uh, really connected to the fortress, but okay, let's see what happens. Um. Because beware that when I take this pawn, then I, I am having a pass for myself. And later on, I, I can bring up the king. I think it's better for you actually to, to play it safe here. Uh, you don't need these pawns. Let me tell you that you don't need these pawns in order to make a draw. You can uh, create, you can build a fortress on the king side. King f1, I guess. Exactly. So let's have a look very quickly at how could this work in practice. I think black should play here first h4, so as to avoid white's h4. And now, uh, yeah, I mean, it is difficult to, to know about if, if you haven't seen it before. Actually, white can give up all these pawns. Look, you can give up these three pawns. And even so, you can, can you make a draw here? Funny enough. So what I was looking at, I'll, I'll show you. First, I play h3, which looks uh, incorrect because I'm putting the pawns on the color of my bishop. However, uh, we have a specific idea in mind here. We play something like bishop c6, and after rook takes a3, can you guess here, um, Rohan, how to how to make the draw? Which is um, the fortress for, for white here? Probably white's fortress is up. Mm. I mean, I'm going to take the pawn with the king. I'm going to enter with the king. So when that happens, where would you like to have your king? Um, Try to I, avoid my plan, OK? King F2. But, yeah, but if you put on F2, I can always chase it away by giving checks, right? At some moment. 
So if you want me to, if you don't want me to, to be able to give you checks where to put your king. Yeah, some of uh, your fellow students are finding this idea. James, uh, Sepper, Aha, Havish. King G1. Exactly. This looks unnatural because we're taught to use the king actively in the M game, right? Active king. But actually, I think this is the best way to go here. Yeah, okay. King G1, King H2, and then Bishop E4. Exactly. I think, like, yeah, let's say I just pick up the pawn, something like this. And you play just anything, like, like Bishop F3. I think this is a nice fortress for white. We're material down, but uh, how is black supposed to win this? I mean, let, let's let's play out a few moves here. Let's say we bring in the king. Okay, now we should go far away. Maybe we shouldn't keep it very close. Let's keep it a little less, a uh, little, little more far away. Something like this. Okay, we we made a lot of move with black now. Please notice that we should never. I mean, we could put the bishop here, but you should of course never let them take on f3. But okay, we'll stay here. Uh, okay, bishop a8 says separate. Yeah, you can put the bishop on a8 if you like. Uh, okay, so I, I don't think there is a way for black to progress here. Or, or what, what do you think? Uh, what do you think, uh, Rohan? Can uh, white uh, lose this endgame? I mean, can black win it? Is there a way to win? I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a win here. I don't think so either. I mean, the only way that they could progress is by f3, but as you all know, these uh, h pawns are not uh, very useful in this endgame. So, uh, yeah, white, white will make a draw here. So, uh, interesting. Something like that happened in the game. I, I didn't invent this myself. Uh, in the game, Kovalev 2 can be 5 very quickly. I think any other move would let black play rook c5 and winning chances because we keep pawns on both flanks. So, bishop takes b5, uh, rook c5 was played in the game, a4, rook takes c5, and now we can see what uh, happened here. Kovalev knows his endgames h3 and yeah there is your move rohan king g1 king h2 okay so he kept some extra pawn in this uh, case yeah he took the pawn on h7 but i mean it, it didn't really matter so we ended up in the same story anyway yeah and later on this game was was a draw so interesting fortress not very common i would say uh but but very, yeah very interesting okay maybe we should uh try to wrap it up here yeah, okay. Uh, here is one of my own games. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a Blitz game. Uh, not too high quality, but still, uh, it gives us a chance to apply the fortress idea in practice. White is suffering in this endgame. As you can see, black is having a strong passport on the C file. I would like to know what you think we should do about that. So please send me white's best choice here, how to save white in this difficult situation. I think I will have to give you two minutes because it's not that easy. So two minutes, please send me White's way out of this difficult endgame. Oh, this was a difficult one. I don't get a single correct answer. Um, hint. We will end up in a very different material relation here. Okay, um, let's uh, let's listen to somebody here. Um, maybe Annika. Uh, Annika has a has the right move. So uh, let's listen to Annika. You found the first move, Annika. Let's exit. So the first move is knight d three. There are two reasons. One, I wanted to protect the c one square. Sure, sure. And then two, I wanted to remove the rook from like the knight. So uh -huh. he'll probably play c2 here. Yeah, I think so. C2 probably because I looked at rook d2 as well. Here, probably you can go for the rook end game and you, you should make a draw here without any difficulty. Yeah, you're you're probably even playing for a win. No, it's, it's going to be a draw, but okay. Uh, anyway, no danger for you. You can put the rook behind the pass pawn and yeah, white will never lose. So definitely c2 is the critical move here. And here comes the difficult uh, move. So some people were saying rook c6, for example, which is usual. No? It's a common uh, idea in endgame to put your rook behind the passport. But after rook d2, white is suffering here. Black is going to play knight e3, and there will be motives connected to the advance of the passport. Also, we're attacking the pawn g2. So after knight e3, c2, rook c6, and uh, doesn't really work. 
and there aren't many moves. King g1 says uh, James, but then I guess I could play here rook d2. As you know, whenever you have your king on the first rank, uh, there might be problems uh, like this, you know, tactical problems. I'm threatening now rook d1. I think here black is winning. So what to do then? What to do about this uh, adv the advance of the past pawn? What if we apply the idea of the fortress? Where is the fortress? Where is it? Okay, Havish, you found it. Correct. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, okay, Annika, how can we uh, get to the fortress situation here? What do you think? Um, maybe do something like King G1. Yeah, that's what we were looking at, right? King G1 has the problem that I put my rook on D2 and you, uh, you have issues with the king on the first rank. What if you give up some material here? What if you give up some material? Uh, um, what if you let... Uh -huh. Rook x f5, rook takes f5, and king g1. Aha, uh -huh. but then unfortunately, your king is too far away to be able to cope with the c pawn, right? I mean, I, I can play something like rook d5, and yeah, I'm going to win there rather easily. So, you know, you should do the, what can I say, the forbidden thing here. You should let black queen. You should let black queen, okay? Okay. So, if you're going to let th them queen, uh, <laughs> we have to get something in return for the queen, right? So knight except two. Exactly, knight except two. And I, I was very happy that I was able to see it in, in a blitz game. So c1 queen and uh, the next move, yeah, it's not so difficult, of course. We should take that knight. And here, actually, if, if you look at this carefully, you can see that we are not even material down. We have a rook and a knight and a pawn for the queen. So we should be able to save this. And we're very fortunate that we're attacking the pawn on, on b5, because if black takes and if they would be able to keep this pawn on the board, then uh, they will probably win, but we can just take the pawn and it's going to be a draw. So in the game, my opponent played queen c7 check. I simply played here g3, and after queen c2. And uh, where do you think we should put this rook, uh, Annika? The rook on f5. Um, maybe we can put it like on rook f6 or rook okay. f4. But no, rook f4 is not supported actually. Yeah, rook f4 is possible. It's, it's supported by the pawn. The only bad thing about rook f4 is that we're not protecting the pawn on a3. And you don't want to lose that pawn, uh, do you? So a, a better place for the rook, where would it be? Um, f3. Aha, rook f3. And here my opponent played king g6 and I simply played king g2. So a uh, question from Sapper, how do you win this in the blitz game? Well, as you can guess, my opponent pressed too hard for a win and somehow they ended up in a... In a Fork some, somehow they tried to move over the king to the to the opposite flank and yeah something something happened here. But anyway, that doesn't matter. As you can see here, my fortress is ready. The only thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to move my rook. I have several safe squares here. Uh, the safest one is d3. It's protected by the knight. Uh, I can also move my king. Uh, yeah, I don't know, king g1, king g2. Uh, I will wait here. No way I can I can lose this. So uh, this is very easy to understand. The difficult thing is to opt for this idea uh, from this position, because here uh, nobody wants to let their opponent queen, right? Most people would look immediately at the move rook c6, which is troublesome for white, like we were saying, rook d2. Uh, you would look for basically any way to continue here without letting black queen. But the only way out is actually to let them queen by playing here knight d3. And after c2, we just take, we let them queen, but we make sure that we have a fortress working. Okay, guys, I think that's it for today. I hope uh, you have enjoyed this uh, lecture on uh, fortresses, and I'm, I hope you can use this knowledge soon in your own games. Uh, thanks again, and uh, see you soon.